Number 25. What is the gospel? Is the third angel's message really good news? Continued. I included along with the question, what do you understand to be the essence of the gospel, the question, how do you relate the gospel to the third angel's message? Is the third angel's message really good news? Oh. We have a discussion going on this, this little thing right here. Can you uh, interpret that for us? A uh, quotation from Selected Messages, Book One, on what we were discussing earlier. There are men today who express their belief that there will be marriages and births in the new earth, but those who believe the scriptures cannot accept such doctrines. The doctrine that children will be born in the new earth is not a part of the sure word of prophecy. This is Selected Messages, Book One, page 172. The words of Christ are too plain to be misunderstood. They should forever settle the question of marriages and births in the new earth. Neither those who shall be raised from the dead nor those who shall be translated without seeing death will marry or be given in marriage. They will be as the angels of God, members of the royal family. And then she goes on, I would say to those who hold views contrary to this plain declaration of Christ, upon such matters, silence is eloquence. It is presumption to indulge in suppositions and theories regarding matters that God has not made known to us in his word. We need not enter into speculation regarding our future state. To my ministering brethren, I would say, preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season. Do not bring to the foundation wood and hay and stubble, that is, your own surmisings and speculations which can benefit no one. Christ withheld no truths essential to our salvation. Those things that are revealed are for us and our children, but we are not to allow our imagination to frame doctrines concerning things not revealed. But one shouldn't end there. The next line says, the Lord has made every provision for our happiness in the future life, but he has made no revelations regarding these plans, and we are not to speculate concerning them. Neither are we to measure the conditions of the future life by the conditions of this life. And so on. it's very well done. I, it's very good advice. How do you feel? Can you uh, read that and believe that there's a possibility for there to be births in the new earth? No, I would understand no. I, in fact, I, I, no, one doesn't want to get into speculations, but on the basis of her statement that on this earth we are beings of a distinct order, I, one needs to be careful going beyond simple statements like this. It seems to me that the great controversy having begun, we were created a special order of beings so as most eloquently to demonstrate and illustrate to the universe and to us uh, what God wished to say and, um, and how he wished to be seen. Because we, a number, I think somebody mentioned this very clearly last week, who better than a parent can understand what God has wanted to say and how difficult it is to say, to get a hearing and to train people and to teach them. So I think God has really invited us to enter with him into the, the revelation and to learn how to sympathize with the, the difficulty and the delicacy of what he's been trying to teach to us without infringing on our freedom by creating us male and female, capable almost of creating in our own image, procreating, and bringing up little people, what influence we have over them. And yet if we do our duty, we will set them free, may even watch some of them leave us, and we should grieve as they go as God has. I think we'll find in the hereafter how great has been the privilege of us human beings in almost entering with God into this revelation. I'm not trying to compare us with God, but I think he's given us this chance to feel and experience and see and understand. At least who better than parents and teachers should be in a position to sympathize with God in what he's been trying to do and thus be able more in God's way to convey this message as he wishes it to be conveyed. We may find we have enjoyed a very rare privilege on this planet, though it may never be done again, as far as that's concerned. But um, enough said on that. I, I like her suggestion. As on the 144,000, the kind of people they were, we can't say too much. On the number, she says, silence is golden. That's good advice. Is this your copy? Now, we just have a little while left, and I, I don't know how much time we ought to spend on this. I find it more and more interesting every time I look at it. But 
We understand as Seventh-day Adventists that we have been especially commissioned to give the third angel's message. In fact, don't we sometimes suggest that when a Christian accepts the third angel's message, he becomes not just a Christian, he's now a Seventh-day Adventist Christian. So the mark of a, an Adventist is he's a Christian who accepts the third angel's message. We also understand that our commission is not just to give the third angel's message, but to give the gospel. Do we have two messages? Or are they one and the same? Is the third angel's message the gospel, the gospel meaning good news? We also understand that the third angel's message is righteousness by faith. So is the gospel, the third angel's message, righteousness by faith? Are they essentially the same? This leads one then to read it out loud. If anyone worships the beast and its image and receives a mark on his forehead or on his hand, he also shall drink the wine of God's wrath, poured unmixed into the cup of his anger, and he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. Has there been any good news yet? Just five lines to go. And the smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever, and they have no rest day or night, these worshippers of the beast and its image, and whoever receives the mark of its name. That's the third angel's message. So the difference between a Methodist Christian and a Seventh-day Adventist Christian is that an Adventist Christian is a Christian who believes in this final awful destruction of the wicked. Is that what distinguishes us? It hardly seems like good news, does it? And where's the righteousness by faith in this? Well, fortunately, we've all worked on this before, I'm sure. In our Sabbath school lessons of last quarter, this quarter, and for the next four, hopefully we'll keep in mind the purpose expressed in um, January of this year. Do you remember, right before the first lesson it said that in this new series, we would be concentrating on the meaning of the three angels' messages, and that in our next six quarterlies, we will deal with various aspects of the three angels' messages. My experience has been, though, when I've been visiting elsewhere, that most Sabbath school classes are not reminding themselves that they're supposed to be studying the three angels' messages. Um, have you recently, when going through a Sabbath school lesson, uh, reminded yourself it's not only an interesting lesson, but what does it have to say about the three angels' messages? It adds tremendous significance to the lessons, I think, to bring this up. For example, what was our lesson last week? as you recall, on man and sin. Now, that's a big subject in itself, but it's not the purpose of the Sabbath school department that we just study again the problem of man and sin, or next week, man and God. But having studied this, how do you relate that to the three angels' messages? Last quarter, when we had the lesson, uh, God cares for people, you remember? Well, that's a lovely lesson in itself, but it, it uh, assumes a great deal more significance when you um, restudy that subject, how much God cares for people, and then ask, how then could he give the three angels' message? I mean, the third angel's message. God cares for people, burning them up like this. Uh, to try to relate each lesson to the three angels' messages becomes, I think, a very profitable exercise. And we've been invited to do it by the General Conference Sabbath School Department, and I'm for doing it. I'm going to stubbornly continue to do it in my class for these six quarters, because I, I think it's well worth it. Yes. Your father won't burn up anyone. Yes. Only man. Yes. Your father will deliver man unto man. Yes. I can't see God. Why is such language then, do you think? See, this is, I think, a fair question. We know the good news about God, sustained by all of Scripture. How could he talk like this? I think he'll deliver man up. He'll allow man to do as he wishes. Now, those who choose the way of their father will go with their father. Yes. Those that choose the way of Satan will go with Satan. I can't see the father tormenting anyone. If we can state that so clearly, why wouldn't John, under inspiration, state it at least as clearly? Perhaps why would he use this kind of language? Well, perhaps he did state it clearly yeah. to those who have ears to hear it. Yeah, all right. <laughs> I mean, a lot depends upon what we read into these words. Have we been prepared by many similar, though not 
perhaps quite so fearsome statements in Scripture. Have we been prepared by these to understand the intention of these words here? Can you think of other occasions? If you just take these words out of context, just the way they read, it's a most fearsome picture of God. He not only destroys the wicked, but he says um, they have no rest day or night in their torment. We say we don't believe in hell. That is, we just have a shorter hell than other people. Is that it? You know, people can put us in a bad light if they try just a little, and some do. How do we answer them? Yes. Uh, remember what God's wrath is. Precisely. So wouldn't that relate to what the general just said? Exactly, in my opinion. Leaving man to man. Every one of those terms calls for interpretation. And uh, since we've done this before, I thought we might spend the whole evening doing that tonight, but I realized uh, that we have gone through this many times. And perhaps if we just reminded each other of the meaning of these terms. Besides, do you remember last quarter the reminder that in the history of our movement, the third angel's message was never presented alone. The third angel's message meant the three angels' messages. They came as a package. Now, if you read them as a package, how does it start out? I saw another angel flying in mid-heaven with an eternal gospel. The three angels' messages start out with a gospel. It's a terrible thing to read the third angel's message without reading the first, and we were never intended to. First of all, this angel comes with the eternal gospel. Now the gospel is the good news about God, Romans 1. In it, the righteousness of God is revealed. So here is an angel bearing the good news that God is not the kind of person Satan has made him out to be. He is, as we were talking earlier, a righteous, trustworthy God. Does the first angel come with a new message? Do Adventists, do they arise in 1844 with a new gospel? They'd better not think what Paul said. If anybody arises with a different gospel from the one I presented, even an angel from heaven, look what should happen to him. Did Paul come with a new gospel? Not at all. Is this not the same truth about God that the loyal angels maintained before this earth was ever created? The issue has always been about God. This is the everlasting good news. It has never changed. It's just that more and more evidence has been presented to corroborate it and support it. To proclaim to those who dwell on earth, to every nation and tribe and tongue and people. And he said with a loud voice, fear God. Now we've talked about fear. There is no fear in love, right, First John? Fear has to do with punishment, not worship. Perfect love casts out all fear. What's the meaning? Fear God. Yeah, it's reverence here. Moses stood at the foot of Sinai when they were afraid and said, there is nothing to be afraid of. We know what to read into the word fear, don't we? Revere God. Some versions even dare go that far. Maybe you have one. Reverence God. Revere God. And give him glory, for the hour of his judgment has come. Now there's the whole subject of the judgment to go into. What's the issue in the judgment? What's the basis for the judgment? We understand the Father has entrusted the judgment to the Son, but the Son says in John, you know, I don't judge anybody. I have brought light, and some have preferred darkness rather than light, and so really you have judged yourselves, he says. And all God does in the end is, as in the words of Revelation, to simply pronounce his diagnosis. He says, let him that is filthy stay that way. Let him that has rejected the truth reap the consequences, which he already has in his life, of rejecting the truth. If we come to the truth, the truth has power to sanctify and to heal. And so if we have come to the truth, we have been healed and restored and become safe to save. If we have rejected the truth and have preferred darkness rather than light, what happens to a person, Romans 1, to those who suppressed and rejected the truth? Look at the awful description of what happened to them. They even to the, came to the place where their morals were unspeakable. Do you remember in Romans 1, that whole description? Does God need to judge such a person? All he says is, with sorrow, let him that is filthy stay that way. But let him that is righteous stay that way. See, God doesn't have to pronounce any kind of arbitrary judgment. He's our healer, and he wishes all to be saved and healed. But if we're unwilling to come, as a patient should, to the divine physician and be healed, what can he do but give us up and we will perish? And he says, if you prefer 
to stay ill and to die. What else can I do? I can't force you to be well. So we read a lot into the judgment, don't we? But the hour of, of decision has come. Aren't we people who give the eternal gospel, but in the setting of the judgment hour message? We have come at the end of time, not with a new gospel, but to indicate it's time for everything to finish, for all to decide. So make up your minds about God and worship him, the creator. Can you see how the Sabbath would come into that immediately? The Sabbath belongs in here, although it's not specifically mentioned. Then another angel, a second, came, saying, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. Look what we can read into that. Supposing we just took from uh, Isaiah and Ezekiel. Do you remember the king of Babylon, elsewhere called the king of Tyre, who then is revealed to be Lucifer, the adversary? The meaning of Babylon is confusion. Babylon is the symbol for the opposition in the great controversy. For, the, for Satan's charges, for all that is confused and erroneous in the great controversy. Uh, this is the lie. And uh, this angel is saying, Satan's side in the great controversy is false, it is confused, it is in error, and eventually it even falls in authority and in power. Don't ally yourself with the opposition. In Revelation 13, the previous chapter, don't we find that most people have preferred Babylon? Most have, even though it's fallen and is corrupt. And they have not accepted the first angel's message, and they don't worship the Creator. And they haven't accepted the good news. Instead of the truth, isn't the truth a synonym for the good news? It's the same. What have they preferred to the truth, to the good news? But rather the lie and the father of lies. Have they accepted Christ, the Creator? Colossians 1.16, who is the Creator? No, they've preferred the substitute Christ, the one who said, I will be like the Most High, and sets himself up as God, and who even asked Christ to worship him. I mean, think how much we can read from the previous 65 books into these three angels' messages. Now the third angel says, I offer you this final clear teaching of the good news about God. This last presentation of the truth, I invite you to vote yes for God in the great controversy, to recognize him for who he is and to worship him, to love and admire him and be willing to do things his way. Don't ally yourself with the opposition. God has very graciously given the opposition freedom to represent itself. You could count on him to do it. But there does come a day when there's no point in continuing this any longer. Now, God is not willing that any should perish, 2 Peter 3, but that all should come to repentance. But there comes a day, as in 2 Chronicles, I'm just thinking of many places that pop into mind, when God has to say, I send all my prophets, but you rejected them, till finally there was no remedy, and I had to let you go. Hosea 11, Israel is bent on leaving me, the yoke is all they are fit for, and I must let them go. And so we read into the third message, the time will come when it will make no sense for even our infinitely gracious God to continue this thing any longer. All is settled. The eternal gospel has gone to every person on this earth. It says to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people. Everyone with power to think, with the power of reason, has had an opportunity to vote intelligently, yes or no. More than that, We've become either so settled into the truth that we cannot be moved or settled into the lie that we cannot be moved. And God announces that it is done. And then he, quotes, pours out his wrath on those who receive this mark. Now, what is this mark? Well, you look back in Revelation 13. Suppose you've taken it as the number, 666. Now, we could get quite involved here. But even if you take it as the old Vicarius Filii Dei, which we've taken traditionally, that means literally substitute for the Son of God. Isn't that really Satan's side in the great controversy all along? He has not only opposed Christ, but he has wanted to be taken as Christ and worshipped as God. He has set himself up as the substitute for the Son of God. When he comes in the end, in his last great endeavor to win the inhabitants of this planet to his side, how does he choose to appear? But as Christ, looking like Christ, quoting the scriptures, healing the sick, his evil angels appearing as angels of light. Ellen White says, resembling the description of Christ in the book of Revelation. 
He wants to be revered as Christ. He is the substitute for the Son of God. If you don't like to use the number 666 in that way, Vicarius Filii Dei, there's a great deal of evidence that the very number 666 is fascinating to trace it back has represented the devil's side in the great controversy. It has represented devil worship, fertility worship. Think how that has been represented in the religions of antiquity. So just the number itself represents Satan's side. Or if you take the mark just a moment as not just 666, but a mark that matches the name that is in the forehead of the savable people. You remember Ellen White says first of the seal of God that is opposed to the mark of the beast. She says the seal is not any sign or mark that can be seen. It means rather to be so settled into the truth, both intellectually and spiritually, that one cannot be moved with all the healing and transforming effect that that has. Supposing you've been so settled into the lie that you cannot be moved. Think of the devastating effect that this has on one. That's really the mark of the beast and the seal of God. Of course, that may manifest itself in the keeping of the true Sabbath, which represents our worship of the true Christ and of his having said the truth about his Father. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Besides, Christ is God anyway, is he not? If you want to know what God is like, look at Christ, for Christ is God. Or accept his words, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Either way, it comes out the same. Every Sabbath, we testify to the position we have taken about God, the kind of person he is. If you accept the mark of the beast, you have shown a preference for Satan as the substitute, or you have accepted his lies about God. And therefore, you might keep a substitute day to represent your preference for the substitute Christ just as those who recognize the true Christ keep the true day that is part of the eternal good news. Or supposing you take it as the name of God in the forehead, Ellen White says the name of God in the forehead represents intelligent obedience. See, these are not superficial, arbitrary things. These people who receive God, God's wrath, you see, have the enemy's mark on their foreheads. They obey him. They prefer him. They worship him. And is it not a law that we become like the person we worship and admire? There's so many ways you can say this, and it all comes out the same. There are only two sides in the great controversy. There's the truth about God. There's the lie about God. There are the two great adversaries, Christ who has sought to present the truth about his Father, Satan who has circulated lies about the Father since the very beginning. And we take our sides. The, the, the devastating error that one could make, though, is to apparently be on the right side in what one does externally, but inwardly doing these right things for the wrong reason, one is on the devil's side in the great controversy. And that's where very religious people who have the opportunities that we have could make such a sad mistake. It's been done before. Some did it in 1888, and I'm sure it'll be repeated in the end. Now, how does God regard those who prefer the lies to the truth? Well, in Romans 1, how does God regard those who would rather worship creeping things? Do you remember in Romans 1? It says, those who suppress the truth and by their wickedness obscure and twisted and perverted. In fact, the very words, I think, are the most relevant ones right behind the third angel's message. How does God feel? Well, verse 18, it's right after Paul has referred to his pride in the good news, for in it the righteousness of God is revealed. But then in verse 18 he says, but the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against what kind of people? Particularly those who suppress the truth, for they've had a chance to know God has made it plain to them, but they have preferred to worship images resembling mortal man or birds or animals or reptiles to our gracious, infinite, and intelligent God. If you were God and your creatures, whom you have so greatly endowed with power like your own, the image of God, as in our lessons this quarter, very appropriately, think of the godlike power that God has entrusted us with. And you have revealed yourself in nature and then ultimately in your son coming to this earth and saying, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And if in spite of that, 
people would rather worship a beetle, a crocodile, a fly, Dagon, Moloch, or anything else other than your gracious, intelligent, infinitely powerful self who wishes nothing but the best for your creatures. What do you do with people like that? Does it do any good to beat them up? Is it any surprise then that in verse 24, it simply says, therefore God gave them up. Even with our children, you know, if we've tried for 21 years to lead them to all the things we wish for them, and at 21, we have not succeeded. There's nothing we can do but let them go. There's just nothing one can do but let them go. Would you beat them up before you let them go? Would you be sad as they left? Might you help them pack? Would you weep as you help them pack? How would you feel as you watch them go down the road? The thought that we would be furiously angry with them, rush after them and beat them as they go. Well, if we humans would have such feelings if we saw our children go, how do you suppose God feels when he has to give up people who'd rather worship a fly, a crocodile, a beetle, and so on? or those who'd rather accept Satan's lies that you're a fierce, harsh, arbitrary, demanding deity in spite of all you have revealed about yourself, in spite of Calvary, in spite of the life of Jesus, and they still hang on to that false notion. You can't change it by force, can you? So it says, therefore God gave them up. But when God gives people up to the worship of these things, look what they become like. And you notice it specifically says, verse 25, because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie, you see, and worshipped and served something created rather than the creator. For this reason, verse 26, God gave them up. But look what he gave them up to. It's unspeakable. And verse 28, since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God for the third time, it says, gave them up. And look at what he gives them up to. See, when God gives people up and ceases to restrain us, people with our sinful natures and inclinations and tendencies, look what we become like. And we're warned that when he gives us up, the consequences are terrible. And then, of course, we're reminded of Hosea 11 and many other places in Scripture where God says, if you're bent on leaving me in my free universe, I will let you go. But if I let you go, the consequences are terrible and I would spare you. And since we were not impressed by all his warnings and even his, his venturing to discipline us directly many times in the Old Testament, that didn't seem to impress people very much. Finally, God said, if nothing else will impress you, then my son will come and he will die the death that is the ultimate consequence of sinning. He was made to be sinned, though he knew no sin. Watch my son die. For one thing, you will find it so terrible that even the universe will not be able to watch it all. It will be so dreadful. But more than that, while you see my son dying that awful death, when I pour out my wrath on him as a sinner, you will notice that I'm not angry with my son. I'm crying over my son. How can I give you up? In fact, it will be correct for Ellen White to say some years in the future that I was crucified with my son. The Father was in Christ, reconciling the world unto the, himself. The Father was sacrificed himself with the Son. You know all those statements. And Jesus didn't cry out, God, why are you so angry with me that you're executing me? Encouraging us to say, so that's what you're going to do to us in the end. Jesus cried out in full harmony with all these passages in Scripture. God, I know you are making me to be sin, though I knew no sin. He knew he wasn't a sinner, didn't he? He said, the devil is coming and finds nothing in me. He could say that of himself, something we could never say. Nevertheless, he knew that the wrath of the Father was being poured out on him as a sinner. And what did he cry out? My God, my God, why are you so angry with me that you're killing me? No, he cried out, and he could have quoted Hosea 11. He could have quoted Paul before he wrote it in Romans 1. My God, my God, why have you given me up? Why have you handed me over? And Romans 4.25 says that God gave up his son, handed him over, and he died the death of a sinner. And so where it says in Romans 14, as you intimated, when the wrath of God is poured out without mixture and he ceases to protect us from the consequences, we will experience for the first time 
God ultimately giving us up. And when God gives his creatures up, well, creatures can't live separate from God. It's a marvel of grace that any of us are alive at all, isn't it? We're all under grace. We're not under law. We'd be dead. And God ceases to protect. He ceases to sustain. Now, with the protection, one of God's greatest acts of protection and grace has been his veiling the dazzling splendor of his divinity. The moment Adam and Eve sinned, the light of God went out from the face of nature, or earthly mortals would have been consumed. You remember all the quotations we read. Even an angel, should he appear in his glory, would consume us with his reflected glory. The people couldn't look at Moses and how little he'd seen of God. He so brightly reflected the glory of God. In the end, God will unveil his life-giving glory. And remember the quotation? The glory of God will bring life to the righteous and will slay the wicked. He's not two-faced. It's only life-giving glory. But those who are out of harmony will be consumed. In mercy, this earth is a dark place. Remember Ellen White said when she came out of vision, this earth is a dark place. In mercy, it's a dark place. But God cannot come as he is to this earth. Christ cannot come. The angels cannot come as they are. When they come back the next time, they come in unveiled glory. In Thessalonians, the wicked are slain by the brightness of his coming. At the end of the millennium, he fully unveils his glory. And not only are those who are out of harmony with consumed, but the very elements melt with fervent heat. And this whole earth, it would appear, is returned to the condition it was in before day one. And perhaps creation has to be repeated all over again. And one wonders how God may choose to do it for our instruction as we look on. But if one can read the previous 65 books into the third angel's message, do you see here an angry, fierce, destructive God? Is this not the God who says, I destroy no one? He's our physician. But can the physician and savior, you know, means physician, healer, can any physician force a patient to be well? If the patient is unwilling to come and accept healing, and the wonderful thing about God is he's the only physician he can do this, but if we're willing to come as a patient into God's office, as it were, he can absolutely guarantee a cure for every single condition. There is no one who cannot be cured if he's just willing to come and stand there as a patient should in the presence of an infinitely skillful physician and say, tell me what I have to do to be well. Now the jailer said, what do I have to do to be saved? Well, the Greek is, what do I have to do to be well? It's the same word exactly. And so in faith, once we have faith that he is the supreme creator, we stand in his presence and say, what do I have to do to be well? And God can say, if you really mean that and you're willing to accept your medication, and the ultimate medication is truth, we are sanctified by the truth. You remember, the gospel has power to save and to heal, Romans 1. If we're willing to accept the divine medication, every one of us can be healed. Now, the only person who can't be healed is either the person who won't come and won't let the physician help, stubbornly stays away or in scorn stays away, or the patient, and this is the most arrogant, wasteful one, who comes repeatedly to the divine physician, asks what to do, is given the prescription, the medication to take, the exercise to engage in, the regimen to follow, and on the way home throws the pills away, ignores the routine, and goes on as if no advice had been given. These are the saddest ones and also the most foolish and ungrateful ones. These are the ones who have known the truth, Romans 1, but have preferred to reject it and suppress it. So truly in the end, when these patients who have rejected the healing that is available, when they arise in the second resurrection at the end of the millennium, and they look and high above the city is Christ in his human form, and they, they recognize their doctor, their physician as it were, and they know that he tried his level best to heal, what can they do but kneel down and admit that their loss is their own fault? I mean, the logic of the thing is so absolutely overwhelming there. But supposing now, and there are physicians here, supposing you have a patient who in spite of your best efforts, and you happen to know there is specific medication for his condition, but he won't take it. 
He maybe pretends to take the medicine, but you know he actually pours it down the drain, you know. And things go from bad to worse. What do you do for the patient? Might you speak sternly to him? Might you speak so sternly that he might go home one day almost afraid of you because you really have leveled with him? You have told him that he is going to die if he doesn't take the medicine. Might you even seem very exercised over the patient? Might you even warn him of the consequences in fearsome terms? like the third angel's message, because he apparently isn't impressed very easily. And you have to describe the, the awfulness of the death that results from this particular disease, but he can be spared this if he'll just take his medication. I mean, if you really loved the patient, wouldn't you run that risk of even terrifying him if need be, in order to win a little respect for his life, for himself, for what might happen? and a realization that there is a remedy if he just has enough good sense to accept the, the, the suggestions of the physician. But what if the patient still won't take the medicine? What do you do? If he now has a few hours to live, and you've gone to see him for the last time in the hospital, and he's obviously gasping his last, what do you do to him as just a human physician? You've learned to like him very much. As a matter of fact, it might be somebody you, you have special concern for. You could even say you love this person. And it would be a great disappointment to you to lose this person. Also, an immense frustration because there's absolutely no reason why this patient should die. Imagine the feelings that you'd have. Would you say, well, you have a few hours to live, but I'm not going to give you the privilege of just dying. Justice demands that I torment you a while because you richly deserve it. And you pour out your wrath on that patient and give him what for, and then you kill him. You don't need to kill him. He's going to die anyway. Does God need to kill the wicked? They're going to die anyway. You stand there as a source of life. God destroys no one. But the glory of him who is love, which brings life to the righteous, if you won't accept it, if you're so utterly changed by the rejection of it, the very presence of this loving Supremely powerful physician terminates the life of this individual. But he would, it's as if God says to the wicked at the end, I don't want any misunderstanding that you should think I'm executing any of you. So I've raised you all here at the end of the millennium. Some of you died uh, among the 185,000 Assyrians, and I had a hand in that. Some of you died the first born in Egypt. I had a hand in that. Some of you died in the flood. I had a hand in that. I don't want anyone in this universe to think that anybody's dead because I terminated his life. That was just the first death. In fact, you don't even remember being asleep to you all these years. You woke the next minute, didn't you? And here you are all standing outside the New Jerusalem. As far as I'm concerned, you're all welcome. And he throws open the gates, as it were, and invites them in. But their very unfitness for the place, you see, results in the glory of him who is love consuming them. You know, this is inconceivable, but if they should approach wanting to enter, and by some oversight in the divine computer, maybe there might be one savable saint out there, he could walk right on in and be perfectly safe, couldn't he? Of course, there won't be such a mistake made. But why is it that the wicked perish? Isn't it that they are simply so changed by their rejection of the truth, their refusal of the provisions of healing and salvation, of their preference for the lie? They have been so changed that the very life-giving glory of him who is love when unveiled, which should bring life and energy and glorification to people, consumes them. Now, how do you think God feels as they perish? Well, if a doctor can feel the way he does, or a parent can feel the way he does when he sees his son go and never come back, how do you suppose the infinite one feels? Well, why do you think the Bible says all that it does in Hosea 11 and all the other places? Surely God will be crying over the wicked. Why will you die? How can I give you up? How can I let you go? Can we read that into the third angel's message? Well, as someone said, we do know those terms. We've had those terms all before. I just think that no one is equipped to give the three angels' messages who hasn't read the 65 books before it. And appropriately, the three angels' message come in the last book. They're the capstone of the whole message of Scripture, but given in language still needed. Because you know what that, the language of the third angels' message implies? that God still has to talk as he did on Sinai. 
It's a terrible thing that in spite of the revelation of the life of Christ and the meaning of his death, that people are still so unimpressed that he has to talk like this. Now, has God talked too loud? Did he talk too loudly on Sinai? No, 40 days later they were dancing drunk and naked around the golden calf. Did he talk too loudly when he disciplined the family of Achan? Look what they were doing soon thereafter. Has he talked too loudly in the third angel's message? Well, how many people have even heard it? Try walking the streets and stop people on the sidewalk and say, have you heard of the third angel's message? Third angel's message? Uh, that must be something from our Mormon friends, surely. Uh, you know, most folk have never even heard of the third angel's message. Who could say God has talked too loudly? So he has invited us to pick this up, but surely to put it in its, in its full context of the 66 books. But we may have to begin by using these very words. In fact, we're authorized to do that. Because you have to talk like this to impress people at all. In fact, before we're through, this swells into the loud cry of the third angel's message. But when we have to resort to such language, to talk severely even as a doctor may have to as a last resort, we better know what we're doing. And if a doctor finally, having, you know, almost struck terror to the heart of the patient, finally the patient says, you mean it's really that serious? And you think, oh, at last we have communicated. Now I can talk more softly to you. And let me tell you quick, please, if you go on this program, there's still hope for you. And you don't have to talk like this anymore. Hopefully we can give the third angel's message and move quickly on to other language. For the Lord who spoke in fire on Mount Carmel, later when he had a man who was very willing to listen, showed that he much preferred to speak in the still small voice at the mouth of the cave. Wouldn't you rather speak as a still small voice? But you know, sometimes we're so dignified, we are only willing to speak as a still small voice. I think if we care enough as God did, then somehow we've got to be willing to speak as seriously as the wording of the third angel's message. For the gracious Holy Spirit, the spirit of truth and love inspired John, the beloved disciple, to write the third angel's message. I mean, who said more about love than John? And think of the Holy Spirit, the gentle one, inspiring John to write these words. Evidently, it's necessary. So we haven't really done what God wants us to do. If we only go and say, God is so gentle and gracious, we also have to tell the whole picture. But if we prefer to go our own way, Indeed, God will respect our decision and let us go. But the consequences of being let go by our gracious physician God are unspeakable. They're terrible. And the language of the third angel, I believe, is deliberately as terrible as it is, awe-inspiring as it is, because God cares so much that people not reap these consequences. So sometimes we have to talk like this. Parents ought to know about that, shouldn't they? Teachers ought to know about that. You hate to do it, but sometimes you have to. And how grateful you are if you finally break through, and then you don't have to talk this way anymore. Trouble is, we go back and forth, don't we? Sometimes we have to talk this way. Sometimes we can talk more gently. Isn't that the story of the 66 books? God sometimes having to talk this way and be so dramatic, then he gets our attention, but we're scared. So he talks softly. And then we despise him for his weakness, and he has to raise his voice again. Surely we can sympathize with him in this and understand why the third angel's message is so worded. In sum, though, I don't think one can ever give the third without the first. And unless one understands the eternal gospel, he is likely to give the third angel's message in such a way as to misrepresent the truth about God. So we should give all three as a package in the total context of the 66 books, the setting of the great controversy. But it's no light assignment then to give the third angel's message, is it, really? And the best preparation would be the study of all 66. So that's why I think that it will be as a consequence of viewing the word as a whole that we shall be able eventually to give the loud cry of the third angel's message as it was meant to be given. 
Well, it's too late for questions, but maybe next time you could raise some there. Next time, and it's really very closely related to this, how soon do you think the Lord will come? Why has he not come yet? Well, evidently we have not given the three angels messages as we should. Why would this be? What modification would you anticipate? Is it more a fact we have not been obedient to God's requirements? Or is it that not understanding him and the gospel as we should, we have not been able to obey him as we should from the right motivation? I think they're all tied together. Should we pause before we go? Our loving Father in heaven, we understand that thou hast asked thy people in these last days not to go to the world with a new and different gospel or message of salvation, but to take it with a new and final sense of urgency. For there's no reason why time should continue longer. If we had done things as we should, this could all have ended long ago. But now it is our turn to give the three angels messages, beginning with the everlasting gospel, but giving the balanced picture. It is true thou art infinitely gracious, in fact so gracious and so respectful of our freedom that if we prefer to go our own way, thou wilt let us go but the consequences will be unspeakable. And we must give the whole picture and give it candidly and vividly as the Bible does. Grant us the understanding and the, the broad, uh, comprehensive insight into this whole balanced picture as presented throughout Scripture, that we may not give one part of it to the obscuring of another part, but to give this in full balance that while we do warn people of the awful consequences, we do not obscure the truth about thy infinitely gracious self and the message of freedom. And that while we're speaking of thee as infinitely loving and forgiveness personified, we may not deceive people as to the awful consequences of going their own way. Teach us how to bring this into balance, realizing this will have such an influence on our own lives and the quality of our own obedience and the kind of people we become and how this someday will so settle us into the truth in balance as a whole that the Holy Spirit will be able to entrust us with the influence and winsomeness we anticipate someday to swell this message into the loud cry and the eternal gospel will go to every nation under heaven and the end come. We understand this could happen at any time in our generation if we should be willing. May we not waste the opportunity that is ours, we ask in Jesus' name.